So Jason Pangasar will be giving that talk on brain tumors. He's the director of the developmental therapeutics and uh, medical director of the clinical research office at the Aflac Cancer and Blood Disorders Center, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. He's an associate professor of pediatrics at Emory University uh, School of Medicine and holds uh, the Carter S. Martin Endowed Chair in De Developmental Therapeutics. After completing a pediatric hemonc fellowship at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio, he completed an additional neuro-onc fellowship at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. I think I heard of that place. Um, Dr. Fangasar is a member of the uh, COG Brain Tumor Steering uh, Committee, serves as the National Vice Chair of the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium. You, you have accomplished a lot already. Uh, leads the International uh, RAPNO, I don't know, even know what that is, Low Grade Glioma Committee, and is the sole U.S. representative on the CNS Germ, germ Cell Tumor Consensus Panel. He's a PI in numerous large prospective trials in COG, uh, PBTC, and in the industry and his research uh, focuses on clinical trials on CNS tumors, low-grade glioma, and CNS uh, germ cell tumors. The fun fact is that uh, Dr. Fangasara attended college on an acting scholarship and majored in theater before attending medical school. So I'm sure you're in for a great performance. So, all right. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's true about the acting scholarship. And as you can tell by my presence here today, my acting uh, career has skyrocketed. <laughs> Um, so today we're going to take a whirlwind tour down brain tumors. I would suggest if you take care of children with brain tumors in any capacity, you probably can hit the snooze right now. If, however, you are an expert in platelet aggregation, it may be time to take a sip of coffee because it may be a bumpy ride. Um, no, I'm just joking. We're going to make this easy for everybody as we go down so everyone's familiar with brain tumors. So you guys have seen this topical structure already. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but I do want to break down the specifics for solid tumors and brain tumors. And so there's very specific histologies that the board wants you to become familiar with, and within those histologies, they'd like you to understand some characteristics, clinical presentation, diagnostic imaging, pathology, and laboratory findings, and then also a little bit about late effects. And so our goal today is to really look at the very basics of CNS tumor epidemiology and etiology. We'll do a quick neuroanatomy lesson and we'll really discuss the basics of brain tumor pathophysiology in terms of tumor location and symptomatology. And then we'll focus most of the talk on some of these histologies and the breakdown that I mentioned on the previous slide. And then we'll end with some brain tumor specific late effects. My own personal goals is that you get the probably three questions on the test on brain tumors right. Um, and that you all recognize that brain tumors is clearly the most exciting topic. <laughs> okay. so. Red font, before we dive in, I just wanted to make this point. For me, red font is my way of highlighting points that are very important to either memorize or just easy test questions. So I've done this throughout the talk. I've circled things in red or I've highlighted them. So hopefully when you get to your very pointed, you know, studying right before the test, you can just look at the red font. So let's dive right into a general overview of the pediatric brain tumors. So as many of you know, brain tumors are the most common solid malignancy in children and really second only to leukemia among all malignancies. Astrocytomas are the most common brain tumor overall and most of these are low grade. We'll talk about that a little more later. Medulloblastoma is the most common malignant brain tumor. I hate the terms malignant and benign, but my bias is not being tested on. So according to the APB, malignant uh, tumors, medulloblastoma is the most common malignant tumor. You should remember that in general, for all brain tumors, we more commonly see them in males than females, and this depends on the histology. We'll talk a little bit about that more later. And then there's some numbers about incidence on the, um, the slide there and overall survival, which I don't think they will test you on. I think one small key point is that although the overall survival for, for all brain tumors lumped together is very good, it's very deceptive because there are many brain tumors with very poor outcomes and patients who have multiply recurrent disease. So another key point is that pediatric brain tumors, as in most of our diseases, are very different than adult brain tumors. The names may be the same, and even sometimes the histology is the same looking under the microscope, but the biology of these tumors, the treatment paradigm, and the outcomes are very unique. And so this pie chart, which you must memorize, no, you don't need to memorize this at all, um, is to show the point that pediatric brain tumors, there are numerous histologies multiple, whereas if this was a pie chart for adult brain tumors, there would be three or four. It would be um, high-grade glioma, um, it would be meningioma, ependymoma, and then metastatic disease. That's very different than pediatrics. 
So far and away, we don't know what causes brain tumors, but we do have two things that we know causes brain tumors that are very, very rare. And as you know, the board likes to test you on things that are very simple but rare because they can make the point easily. So two reasons that patients can sometimes get brain tumors are a history of ionizing radiation. So for example, a patient who had a brain tumor in the past or patients who were historically treated, for example, for CNS leukemia where radiation was used previously more commonly they have a risk of a secondary brain tumor later in life. Also, there are some genetic predisposition syndromes for brain tumors. This chart, unfortunately, I do think you should become familiar with, although it is kind of bulky. I'm not going to go over the details of this right now, because when we go through the talk, I'm going to point out under each disease process where there's a genetic association. But I wanted to put it here for you, because when you're studying right before the test, you have one chart with all of the genetic disorders. And so I did highlight it in red because I think these are easy test questions. So here's our neuroanatomy basics. Again, very basic. As you all know that there are many different lobes of the brain that have different functions. I don't think it's important that you know this in perfect detail, but on the next few slides we'll talk about how location of tumor in each of these areas may lead to the symptomatology that we see in patients. One point that I do want to make on this slide is the far majority of brain tumors in children, about two-thirds, are located in this area called the infratentorium. So this is this artificial line, this tentorial line, and what's located there mostly is the cerebellum and the brain stem. So a lot of brain tumors in children are located in this area. We do see patients that have tumors in the supratentorium, but it's less common. So here are some of the associations based on the lobe of the brain. Again, I'm not going to go through each of these in painstaking detail, but I will point out a few that I think are important, and then you can look over this later. So for example, the occipital lobe is very important in the vision pathway. So many times patients that have an isolated brain tumor in their occipital lobe can present with vision disturbance or vision dysfunction. That's important. The cerebellum, as I mentioned, in the posterior fossa, which is one of the most common locations for pediatric brain tumors, is your coordinating center. So many of these patients will present with ataxia, they'll present with coordination difficulties. On exam, if you were to do finger to nose with them, they'd have dysmetria and they'd be very wobbly. And then lastly, I wanted to highlight the brain stem, because as you know, many of our cranial nerve nuclei are within the brain stem. And so these patients can present with cranial nerveopathies. So for example, they can have difficulty swallowing, or they can have a lateral rectus palsy, which would be your sixth nerve palsy and a, a palsy of one of your vision or your eye movements. The other ones you can look at, and we'll talk a little bit more as we move on. This is one other way to break down the tumor uh, symptoms that we see in brain tumors. Uh, as opposed to the third column, which I just described on the previous slide, where you can have a very localizing symptom that tells you where a, a brain tumor is. Our neurology colleagues are really good at this, for example. You can have very generalized symptoms, which are more associated with any location of the brain. So patients can come in with developmental delay that is new, or behavioral changes, or school performance changes. Those can be kind of a clue that something's going on that's different in their life and that they have a tumor. Then you can have patients in the second column that present with obstructive hydrocephalus. So as you know, the CSF bathes the brain and spine as a cushion and is continuously in motion. If you have obstruction of this, just like if you have obstruction of a sink, you're going to get backup and built up of pressure. And those patients will present with the common things that we hear about, headaches, vomiting, even vision problems because of papilledema, for example. And then lastly, I wanted to highlight endocrine symptoms. So many patients can have tumors in the hypothalamic pituitary axis, and those patients may present with either um, alone endocrinopathies or endocrinopathies with other symptoms as well. So here's a little bit of a match game when you're really bored, 3 a.m. before the boards and trying to test yourself. Um, you can use this. So really quickly, new onset seizures, for example, would be the temporal lobe. Left-sided arm weakness would be in your right motor cortex because the opposite side. Swallowing difficulties is a brainstem finding. Visual acuity decline, not only the occipital lobe, but if you have an abnormality in your optic pathway, obviously. And then ataxic gait, as I mentioned, would be your cerebellum. So, deep breath, move into your downward dog yoga position. We're going to dive into low-grade glioma, okay? So, low-grade glioma is the most common brain tumor that we see in children. This is a very broad term and spectrum of diagnoses, and you can see numerous histologies. It's kind of a wastebasket term, per se. And you don't need to know all the specifics of histologies. What I would remember is one histology, which is called pilocytic astrocytoma, because it is the most common histology that we see. 
According to the World Health Organization, low-grade gliomas are categorized as grade one or grade two, and they are glial in origin. And as I said, I don't really love malignant and benign, but these would be considered benign tumors or what I prefer as low-grade tumors. We're going to show this pie chart throughout as we go through each of the histologies. That bluish purplish color is all astrocytomas and gliomas, and these are patients with both high and low-grade gliomas. If we break it down into just the low-grade patients, they represent about 40 to 50 percent, depending on the literature that you look at, of all pediatric brain tumors, so far and away the most common one that we see. So what are your risks for developing um, low-grade gliomas as opposed to the the ideology that we just don't know what causes them. There are two things that I think you should keep in mind for this. There's something called the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, or a SEGA, and it's associated with the genetic disorder tuberous sclerosis. I think if you see SEGA on the test or you see tuberous sclerosis on the test, they're trying you to get you to match it to the other one, and that's the answer um, right away. Just do that. Um, Historically, um, these patients have been treated with surgery, but now uh, we have understood that the mTOR pathway is very important in these patients and that has moved into frontline therapy using mTOR inhibitors. I don't think they test you on that, but it is clinically accepted, so I would be aware of it. And then the other diagnosis in low-grade gliomas that you guys know is very important is neurofibromatosis type 1. These are the clinical criteria for diagnosis, and I don't think you need to memorize those per se, but you can see that number four, recognize that having an optic pathway glioma is actually part of the clinical criteria for NF1. And we're going to talk a little bit about NF1 on the next couple slides, because I think it's that important and easy to test upon. So about 15 to 20 or 30 percent of patients with NF1 will develop a low-grade glioma. The most common path, uh, location is the optic pathway, and then second would be the brain stem, and there are other parts of the brain. In these unique patients with low-grade glioma, if it looks classic on MRI imaging, you do not need to do a biopsy to make a diagnosis. But you also don't necessarily have to treat. These patients can have very indolent tumors that can regress on their own. So classically, patients with NF1, we will only treat them if they are having a functional disturbance, like a visual dysfunction because of the tumor, or a new neurologic symptom. Otherwise, we can just monitor them with surveillance imaging. If you're going to treat a patient with a low-grade glioma in NF1, the first line is chemotherapy. And the classic chemotherapy that we use is carboplatin and vincristine, or you can also use monotherapy with vinblastine, which has become more popular. You do not, do not, do not want to use radiation in patients with NF1 because of their high risk of secondary malignancy. In the same line, you don't want to use alkylating agents. So another low-grade glioma chemotherapy we'll talk about later is a combination of TPCV, thioguanine, CCNU. Because of the alkylator and risk of secondary malignancy, you're going to avoid that in patients with NF1. So here's a classic picture of a patient, um, two patients that have NF1. To, um, give your bearings. Uh, it's the opposite. So this is the right side. This is the left side, the back of the head, and then obviously the eyes pointing upward. And then you can see where the um, optic nerve is. There's this mass here, which is an optic glioma. That's a very classic finding in a patient with NF1. If this patient had no visual dysfunction, no neurologic symptoms, believe it or not, you might just watch that, even though it looks like a big mass. And then here, you can see less obvious, but you can see the optic nerves are very torturous and bulky. That patient, too, probably has optic gliomas. And believe it or not, this patient might have more visual disturbance than this patient. It's very variable, and you would treat them only if they had visual dysfunction. So if we look at low-grade glioma and in general, separate from NF1, um, the symptoms are very similar to all the symptoms we talked about at the beginning of the talk. The only unique feature I think that they might highlight in a question is with low-grade glioma, it's usually a more indolent course. So they might say for four to five months, a patient had a little bit of weakness. It seemed to get worse over the last few weeks, as opposed to a high-grade glioma we'll talk about later, where it seems like two weeks ago they started with the symptom and they got bad. Of course, children never follow that pattern in your clinics, but that's what the test will probably put on there to make it obvious for you. Um, diagnosis does need to be made by tissue, so you do want to get as much of the tumor out as possible, the exception being NF1, which we already talked about. This typically does not spread to other parts of the brain and spine or outside of uh, the brain and spine, but there are a few situations where you would do a spine MRI. For example, if a patient had symptoms like back pain, urinary incontinence, you would want to do a baseline spine MRI. Some people do it on every patient. And then there are a few histologies, which I do not think you need to know. For example, pilomyxoid astrocytoma that have an increased risk of spreading, and you would always do a baseline MRI on those patients of the spine. Lumbar cytology is not routinely gotten on these patients.
the pathology, I don't think you will need to recognize this picture, but I think you will need to recognize one thing. For pilocytic astrocytomas, there's something called Rosenthal fibers. Rosenthal fibers are these astrocytic cytoplasmic inclusions. They're corkscrew in appearance. They're eosinophilic or pink um, when you do H and E. And I think on PEST, again, if they say pilocytic astrocytoma or they say Rosenthal fibers, they're wanting you to match them together, and that's the answer, and move on. There are other reasons that you can have Rosenthal fibers, but they wouldn't be tested on the boards for HEMOG. In terms of biology, we have come a long way in understanding the biology of low-grade glioma. And now we understand that the far majority of patients with low-grade glioma have aberrations in the MAP kinase pathway leading to their low-grade glioma. And this is a very simplified representation of that pathway, which you can break down in much more detail. The most common abnormalities that we understand are of BRAF. And so the two most common that we see is a BRAF activation in a low-grade glioma caused by a genetic fusion. It's called BRAF KIA 1549. That is seen in almost all patients with classic pilocytic astrocytoma, and it can be seen in patients with other types of low-grade gliomas as well. And then there's another alternative mechanism of BRAF aberration, which is the V600E mutation. That's the one that you also can see in melanoma, for example. That's seen in less amounts of patients with low-grade glioma, but depending on the histology, we can see it more commonly as well. I think we're at a place in our understanding that they might test you on this at this point. In terms of management and treatment in patients with low-grade glioma, if you can get all of the tumor out, that is what you want to do, and those patients can have very good long-term survival without recurrence. If they have midline tumors that are difficult to resect, then you may need to treat them, and most people will treat up front with chemotherapy, the ones I mentioned previously, carboplatin and vincristine, vinblastine, monotherapy, and then if they're not NF, you may consider TPCV. Radiation is a very effective modality in low-grade glioma, but far and away, most people will avoid it at all cost and rather use multiple other therapies of chemotherapy before going to radiotherapy because of the late effects of neurocognitive decline, ototoxicity, secondary malignancy, and endocrinopathies. Most of these patients will, their, will survive their disease, and so we don't want to give them long-term late effects that they have to live with. We think of low-grade glioma almost as a chronic disease in some sense, like diabetes, where we may have to keep managing it throughout childhood. Typically, as you get to young adulthood, it may peter out and not cause more problems. Targeted therapies are now becoming available, and we can um, target BRAF. We can target MEK, which is downstream from BRAF. All of these agents are in phase one and phase two trials. I do not think they will test you on that. And then the outcomes, as I said, can be very good. If you have a gross total resection, um, you can have five-year survival of 90 to 95 percent. Most patients will live long-term into their adulthood, as I mentioned, but there are patients that have multiple recurrences throughout childhood, as you can see by the event-free survival, which is much lower. One last thing about low-grade glioma, because I think it's an easy, testable thing, is diencephalic syndrome. So this is a rare condition, and it's caused by a tumor in the hypothalamic region or diencephalon, which is your hypothalamus and your thalamus. And it's usually presented in infants where they have failure to thrive that has been undiagnosed. So they often come in emaciated. They can have abnormal eye movements. And with time, oftentimes months, because they oftentimes come to diagnosis late, they can develop vomiting and hydrocephalus. This is most commonly caused by a low-grade astrocytoma in that region. Once you get a tissue diagnosis and you start chemotherapy, the patient slowly will improve. We do not understand the endocrine pathway behind this completely. And this is a classic test question that you might see. A two-year-old female comes with four months of failure to thrive. She's developed vomiting and new nystagmus over the last week. An MRI shows this large mass, again, right side, left side, back of the head, and then you can see this large mass with obstructive hydrocephalus. A biopsy shows pilocytic astrocytoma. The next treatment strategy is chemotherapy, and the patient should improve. Okay, we made it through one. We got a few more to go. So high-grade glioma. High-grade gliomas are much more aggressive and malignant tumors. These patients are classified as World Health Organization grade three and grade four, or quote unquote malignant tumors. And the one that we always hear about in the news is the GBM, because many of our famous senators have died from this diagnosis, unfortunately. It's much more common in adults, but as I mentioned, the biology is very unique in children as compared to adults. Um, in pediatrics, the high-grade gliomas are much less common than the low-grade gliomas we just talked about. They're much more resistant to therapy, and they have a much worse outcome. 
We come back to our pie chart here. Again, that purple area is all gliomas and astrocytomas. If we break it down to high-grade gliomas, it's a much smaller percentage, about 10 to 15 percent of patients. Risk assessment. We talked about this already, but I'm going to say it again because I really think it's a simple test question. Patients who have had a history of radiation exposure are at increased risk of developing a secondary high-grade glioma. And then something that you've heard about multiple times already, Lee-Fromini syndrome, you can have an increased risk of high-grade glioma, and familial adenomatous polyposis, that's always fun to say, and APC gene abnormality. Okay. Symptoms, I talked about this briefly. These patients, classically, the parents would come in and say he was fine until two weeks ago, and he started with headaches, which have just gotten progressively worse, as opposed to the protracted history you'll get with patients who have low-grade gliomas. Diagnosis must be made by tissue. You can't make it by imaging alone. The only exception to this is something we'll talk about separately called DIPG, or diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. The goal of most high-grade gliomas is to get as much of the tumor out as possible, but this is very difficult because it's a very infiltrative tumor with fingers that kind of stretch into your normal brain, so it's often difficult to do that. It rarely spreads to other parts of the brain and spine, but most practitioners will get a baseline spine MRI at the time of diagnosis. Lumbar cytology is not routinely done. And then the pathology, again, I don't think you'll need to recognize this, but the classic pattern that you see is very highly cellular, highly mitotic tumors with vascular proliferation and something called pseudopalisading necrosis. This is a phenomenon where um, there's rapid proliferating cells that are stacked or palisading around a central pale area, and that represents necrotic tissue. In a basic sense, you have a tumor that's growing so fast, it's outgrowing its own blood supply, and parts of it are dying behind it. This is not good, and it's a very bad thing to see on histology. I think if they ever mention any of those terms in the question under pathology, they're trying to get you to recognize that the patient has a GBM and has a very bad prognosis. Diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, a couple of slides on this just to recognize what it is. This is one of the worst outcome tumors that we deal with in patients with brain tumors. It represents about 10 to 12 percent of all pediatric brain tumors. Classically, these are children between the age of five and seven. You don't need to do a biopsy. It has become more popular, and as you do biopsies, we've learned that many of these patients have a unique histone mutation, which I'll highlight on the next slide, but it's called H3K27M. You cannot resect this tumor. Anyone who says they can, you do not want to see that physician. Uh, those patients would have high morbidity and mortality, and it's just not feasible. Patients will often present with the classic triad of symptoms. They'll have cranial nerve symptoms, so coughing with drinking, swallowing difficulties, lateral rectus palsy. They'll have long track signs. They may have hyperreflexia, and then they'll have ataxic gaits. The only known therapy that is beneficially proven to only stall the disease is focal radiotherapy. Mean survival is about 10 to 12 months, and the far, far majority of children will succumb to the disease by the age of two. If they show you this picture, which is, you can see, an engorgement of the ponds, or they give you any of this type of history, the answer is that the child will not survive their disease and has a very poor outcome, and radiotherapy is the only known therapy. So if we look at high-grade gliomas in general, I mentioned the H3K27M mutation specifically. This is a histone mutation that now the World Health Organization actually uses to categorize a group of tumors called midline glioma, H3K27M mutant. So that includes the DIPGs, but you can also have these tumors in other midline locations like the spine or the thalamus, for example. If we do biopsies on patients with DIPG, it's estimated that 80% or more of these patients will have this abnormality. There's a less common histone mutation that I've mentioned there in peripherally located high-grade gliomas seen in adolescents and young adults. I do not think they will test you on that. The treatment. The best-known therapy for patients with high-grade glioma is to get as much of the tumor out as you can and then use a combination of focal radiotherapy followed by chemotherapy. There are historic studies that show with the addition of chemotherapy, there's improvement in survival compared to radiotherapy alone. These um, trials are fraught with very difficult confounding variables, but that's all we have, and so people will say the standard of therapy is a combination of the two. The only unique group is infants, usually less than three, but it's probably biology-driven and not age-driven, that have a more indolent course. And so sometimes these patients can be treated with chemotherapy alone to either avoid or delay radiation, and they have a better outcome. 
So universally, these patients will have poor outcomes. If you look at five-year overall survival of all high-grade gliomas, we're seeing about 15 to 20 percent of patients that have survival. And remember, the DIPG group is much worse than that even. Again, you can remember that the infants have a slightly improved outcome. Okay, we're moving on to one. Everyone okay? Deep breaths? Yeah? The food hasn't kicked into your brain yet? Okay, medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma is the most common malignant brain tumor, so we'll do that for the boards. It's highly aggressive. It's a rapidly growing embryonal tumor. Again, it's located in the posterior fossa. This is important because this has changed over time historically. There is other histologies in other parts of the brain that look like medulloblastoma that are not called medulloblastoma. So for the purposes of this test, if it's a medulloblastoma, it must be in the cerebellum, which is that posterior fossa area. We'll come back to our chart here. A couple things to remember. The second most common brain tumor, we already talked about being the most common malignant. And this one is highly more common in males and females, close to two to one. Represents about 15 to 20% of all patients with brain tumors. There is increased risk in a patient with a a uh, genetic disorder called Gorlin syndrome, also known as nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. That's due to a patch mutation. And then, again, patients with um, FAP or Gardner's or Turcot syndrome due to that APC mutation. Diagnosis and evaluation. These patients, their symptomatology, because they have a tumor in the posterior fossa, they will, represent, they will present in one of two major ways due to obstructive hydrocephalus with nausea, vomiting, and headaches. And sometimes they can have cerebellar signs like ataxia and poor coordination. The imaging will reveal a large heterogeneous mass in the posterior fossa. We'll look at a picture on the next slide. Uh, but it's not diagnostic. So you're going to need to get the tumor out. And the goal is to get as much of the tumor out as possible because that is prognostic. About 30% of patients will have metastatic spread throughout the brain and spine. So every patient with medulloblastoma must get a baseline spine MRI and lumbar cytology. The spine MRI should be done either before surgery or 10 to 14 days after surgery, and the lumbar cytology should be done 10 to 14 days after surgery. If you do things too close to surgery, there are a lot of products or confounding variables from surgery that make it difficult to interpret, and you don't want to do a lumbar puncture before surgery because the patient probably has obstructive hydrocephalus, and unless you want uh, the herniation to occur during your lumbar puncture, that's not a good thing. This is an example of a patient who has a medulloblastoma. Again, your right side, your left side, the back of your head. And you can see this large mass within the posterior fossa or the cerebellum. Histology. Now, I don't think you need to memorize this completely, but there are four classic histologies that are recognized. One is classic, one is called desmoplastic, extremely nodular, and then anaplastic large cell. Historically, desmoplastic and extremely nodular seem to have a better outcome, and anaplastic large cell has a worse outcome. We're learning that biology is much more important in these patients. And again, this is an area in brain tumors that we've become greatly advanced in our understanding of the biology. We now know there are four major subgroups accepted in medulloblastoma. In the medulloblastoma world, there's probably numerous sub, 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 subgroups that you do not need to worry about at all. But you should recognize these four subgroups, the Wnt pathway, the sonic hedgehog pathway, group three, and group four. Treatment paradigms are evolving based on these molecular categorizations and are not yet standard of care. There is a COG trial treating patients with wind tumors with decreased therapy that is ongoing because these patients on retrospective analysis has very good outcomes. And so that's the one that I would remember if you had to remember any of them. The wind pathway has a very good outcome with 90 to 100% survival. This is another breakdown, just a different way of looking at it for your studying to see whichever works best for you. Again, the only one I think that you really should recognize or remember is the Wnt pathway having a very good outcome. And then this is the historical way of breaking down medulloblastoma into standard and high risk. We still use this currently because, as I told you, molecular breakdown is still under development and we don't completely understand it or have not prospectively tested it well enough. Standard risk patients are greater than three years of age. They've had a almost gross total resection or gross total resection of their tumor, no signs of metastasis, and they don't have anaplastic histology. If patients are standard risk, they get treated with craniospinal radiation up front, followed by maintenance chemotherapy that is about a year to a year and a half. Their craniospinal radiation is slightly reduced from the maximum, so 2340 versus 3600 craniospinal, which is our maximum doses. High-risk patients are patients who do have residual disease. 
they do have metastasis either on their spine MRI or lumbar cytology, or they have diffusely anaplastic disease. Those patients are again treated with craniospinal radiation up front, but the higher doses, 3,600 with boost. And their chemotherapy reg regimen is a much more condensed, shorter chemotherapy, typically over six months. And then the infant group, we kind of parse out separately. In the US, we classically use the H3. In Europe, they use four or five, and it varies on protocol. These patients um, typically have a worse outcome, although it depends on their subgrouping exactly. But this is an easily testable point. It's the one time in pediatric brain tumors where the use of high-dose chemotherapy and autologous stem cell rescue is considered effective for either delaying or avoiding radiotherapy completely. And I think they would ask you about that. This is another way to look at the medulloblastoma breakdown. The only thing I'll highlight on this slide, because it's unique, is our M staging. Um, M0 means that there's no tumor spread. M1 means that there's only cytology spread on CSF. And then M2 is um, other tumor in parts of the brain. M3 is um, metastasis to the spine that you can see on imaging. And then M4, which we rarely, rarely see, would be outside of the CNS. You do not do this screening on patients unless they have issues. So if they come in with liver dysfunction or myelosuppression and you're worried, typically in very young infants, you might consider more of a systemic workup. But in general, you classically would not do that. The outcomes really vary depending on age and subgroup. So I don't think you would need to memorize these specifically because as you can see, they vary and they're kind of close together without major distinction. So I would just say remember the WIND subgroup has a really good prognosis. Okay, we're getting towards the latter part here. The next one we're going to talk about is ependymoma. Ependymoma, oh, the coordinated turn page, that was really good. Um, ependymoma is the third most common pediatric CNS tumor. It is uniquely a glial tumor. People don't always recognize this because of the name, but it has ependymal dif differentiation. The ependymal cells are the cells that line your ventricle in your brain. So most of the time, these come from outpockings within the ventricles and present with obstructive hydrocephalus. Um, although they can occur technically anywhere in the brain. The most common locations would be the posterior fossa, which we've talked about before, the cerebellum, and then the lateral ventricles, and then as well in the spinal cord. We come back to our epidemiology look and view, the third most common tumor, and it represents about 8 to 10 percent of all pediatric CNS tumors. There's an increased risk in patients with neurofibromatosis type 2, I didn't put it on here, but I think it's worth noting the other thing that patients with neurofibromatosis type 2 are at risk is bilateral acoustic schwannomas. That usually occurs in young adulthood, but you rarely can see a pediatric patient with it as well. In terms of their symptomatology, um, because they often present with posterior fossa lesions, they present with obstructive hydrocephalus, oftentimes have nausea, vomiting, headache, and ataxia. You cannot make the diagnosis on imaging alone. And then the goal, of course, is a gross total resection. In ependymoma, this is very important, and it's proven prognostic over and over again in many studies. There is also a risk of spread throughout the brain and spine, about 10 to 15 percent at diagnosis. And so you should do the same staging that we talked about in medulloblastoma, both your baseline spine MRI and your lumbar cytology with the same time duration for the same reasons post-surgery. So in terms of imaging, it's not very unique or distinct, so I don't think they would have you differentiate an ependymoma on imaging in any way. But again, your, um, your right side, your left side, your back of your head, and you have a large mass in the posterior fossa. Oftentimes, these can have calcifications, and they can have heterogeneous enhancement. Again, I don't think that's something I would focus your time on remembering. Pathology. This I struggled with. I don't think they are going to test you on this, but there is one unique feature in ependymoma that you may want to remember. They have this unique feature called a uh, perivascular pseudorosette, and that's right here. What it is is around blood vessels, the tumor cells push out to the periphery and look like a vacuole. It's a pseudorosette because it's not a true vacuole in the center. It's um, a vessel. If they tested you on anything, it would be that. Again, if you're bored an hour before the test, think about it. Otherwise, I would forget about that. OK. OK, we are also learning a lot about ependymoma biology, molecular genetics. We don't understand universally how that's going to impact our treatment paradigms, and this is evolving. So I put this on here more for you to look at. I think the only thing that they might test you on is there's something called the Relay fusion that is seen classically in patients with supratentorial ependymoma, and it just has one of the worst outcomes. 
I think if you remember that, you're golden. If you don't remember that, I doubt they'll test you on it. In terms of treatment, maximum surgical resection is the most important thing. This has consistently been found to be important for prognosis, as I mentioned. Um, and then we treat with localized radiotherapy. Uh, we do not treat with craniospinal radiotherapy unless the patient has metastatic disease, and then you can treat with craniospinal radiotherapy as well. The, the role of chemotherapy for your purposes is very unclear. It is never truly proven to benefit overall survival. There are unique circumstances where it decreases the size of the tumor prior to radiotherapy, for example, um, but I don't think you need to keep that in mind. I, in most circumstances, chemotherapy is not first-line therapy at all. A unique caveat to this is very, very young children, so often less than one with a pendomoma you can treat with chemotherapy, oftentimes to avoid radiotherapy or at least delay it. They have very poor outcomes, these infants, but even patients as young as 12 or 15 months, if they have a lesion in their posterior fossa, we actually do focal radiotherapy for those patients. The outcomes. This is one of my very least favorite tumors because the five-year survival looks good but is not at all representative of the true pathway or journey of patients with this disease. So five years, 60 to 80 percent survival. But many of these patients will have multiple, multiple, multiple occurrences. And if you look at outcomes at 10 and 20 and 25 years, more realistically, the overall survival is closer to 30 to 40 percent. And it's a very difficult paradigm for families and physicians where you meet a child at two or three and then they die when they're 17 or 18, and each step of the way you've taken away more of their functional abilities as a child, and so it's, for me, heartbreaking. Um, but for those patients, they do have a very poor outcome long term. Long term. Okay, CNS germ cell tumors. Um, this is the last major category before we talk about a few rare ones, and then we'll talk about late effects. So as I mentioned, this is a rare tumor. As you would guess, it has histologic features to gonadal counterpart germ cell tumors, so like your testicular tumors and your ovarian tumors. And as you all know, this is a unique tumor where we actually have a marker in the blood, usually AFP or HCG, and in brain tumors in the cerebral spinal fluid that can help us make the diagnosis. Classically, there are two major categories. There is something called germinoma, which we will call the non-secreting group, although that's not always true, but for you guys it's true. Um, for non-germinomous germ cell tumors, also known as the secreting group, and they have a worse outcome. And if we look at our breakdown or our pie chart, it's a very small percentage of patients in the United States, about 2 to 3 percent. I think a unique thing that you should remember is in Asian countries in Japan, this represents up to 10 to 15 percent of all pediatric brain tumors. We do not understand the ideology of that. We don't understand if it's diet, geography, or genetics, but it's a fact that is known and something you should keep in mind. There's really no major genetic association with CNS germ cell tumors. There is some literature that patients with Down syndrome may be at increased risk. I don't think they would test you on that. If they did, they were very cruel, but anyhow. Um, CNS germ cell tumor imaging, how you're going to recognize this on a test question or imaging is you're going to see a patient uh, that has a mass in one of two locations, the two most common locations, either the supracellular pituitary region or the pineal region. And this is a sad, sagittal image, as you can see the patient's nose is up here. Um, and you can see this patient actually has a lesion in both of those locations. I put this up here just so you could recognize both locations. And actually, this is a rare phenomenon that we see that's called a doublet or bifocal lesion and is classically a pure germinoma. I broke down the symptoms for this because this is one of those rare tumors where endocrinopathies can be your major presenting symptom. So patients who have supracellular or pituitary tumors can present with months and months of diabetes insipidus, and until somebody gets imaging, they will not diagnose a germ cell tumor. That's very important. And then the pineal region, which as you know is more forward, patients can develop hair node syndrome, which I've defined for you there, vision problems, or increased um, ICP from obstructive hydrocephalus. The pathology, these tumors classically, if you're talking about a germinoma, have one homogeneous histology under the microscope. If you're talking about a non-germinomous germ cell tumor, these patients can have a mixed histology and varying specific histologies. So you may have heard some of these terms, yolk sac tumor um, and brinal carcinoma. Those can be all mixed or sometimes homogeneous in a non-germinomous germ cell tumor. In terms of diagnosis and evaluation, these patients, you do need to get brain and spine MRI. You do want to do lumbar cytology to look for tumor spread, and then you need to do blood and CSF tumor markers, both AFP and beta-HCG. 
on a test question on the boards. If they wanted you to diagnose a patient with a non-germinomatous germ cell tumor by imaging and markers alone, they would have to give you a patient with a mass in the supracellar or pineal region, and the AFP or HCG has to be crazy high, like in the thousands, because otherwise there's very variable and un unagreed upon controversy over lower marker levels. So I think if they did it, it would be a patient as an AFP of 1,000 and you see a mass in the supracellar region. That's a non-germinomatous germ cell tumor. In germinoma, usually the tumor markers are not elevated. Again, this is controversial, so I don't think they would go in between and give you mildly elevated markers. And then the treatment paradigm is similar in general for the two where you start with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, usually something like carboatoposide and, uh, or a phosphamide is sometimes used, and then you go on to radiotherapy. For germinoma, it has been used usually more focal radiotherapy or whole ventricular radiotherapy. For non-germinomous germ cell tumors, this is more controversial, and people have not exactly agreed on it. The most recently published COG trial used craniospinal radiation for these patients, and actually they had very good outcomes. There is this unique thing called growing teratoma syndrome, which I think you should be, be able to recognize. It's a, a phenomenon where patients have tumor markers that go to normal, but the tumor seems to be growing. What's happening is the tumor is differentiating into a teratoma. If that happens, you need to do a second look surgery to remove the mass because radiation and chemotherapy will not tr treat a growing teratoma. Outcomes for germinoma are very good, close to 90%. One of the rare CNS brain tumors, if patients recur, we may be able to actually salvage them. And then non-germinomous germ cell tumors used to be much worse, but now with the combination of chemo and radiotherapy, we're seeing excellent survivals, close to 80 to 90% as well. We're going to do one slide each on these last three rare tumors, ATRT, choroid plexus, and craniopharyngioma. So atypical teroid rhabdoid tumor, ATRT, it's a rare embryonal tumor typically seen in young children and infants. It's about 2% of all pediatric brain tumors, similar to medulloblastoma, which it used to be confused with. You need to do a full metastatic workup, brain and spine, and spinal CSF. Historically, the outcome has been very, very poor with these patients, but with advent of new therapies, two different paradigms, one stem cell transplant, autologous stem cell transplant, and then another modality developed by the Boston group using intrathecal sarco sarcoma-like therapy and multiple intrathecal medicines. These patients are getting closer to 40 to 55, 40 to 50 percent survival at five years. Pathologically, um, when you look under the microscope, these patients will have loss of INI1 on immunohistochemistry. This is a little confusing, so normal tissue should have positive INI1. If you have loss of INI1, it's a positive for a rhabdoid tumor. So that's something to keep in mind. And then there's something called the rhabdoid tumor predisposition syndrome. Due to mutations in the genes I've listed there, it's associated with ATRT, other rhabdoid tumors like kidney rhabdoid tumors, and actually something called schwannomatosis in patients. Um, the unique characteristic about these patients is typically they're under one year of age at the time of diagnosis, so that should help in a test question. Choroid plexus tumors, very briefly, represent about 1 to 2 percent of all CNS brain tumors. There are three varieties, choroid plexus papilloma, atypical papilloma, and then choroid plexus carcinoma. They're usually located in the lateral ventricles, usually in younger children, and usually cause obstructive hydrocephalus type symptoms. These patients, depending on which histology they have, can have a very good outcome or a very poor outcome. The papillomas, as you would guess based on the name, have a very good outcome with surgical resection alone. The atypical choroid plexus papillomas, they will not test you on because even the brain tumor world, no one knows exactly what to do with those. For choroid plexus carcinoma, you're going to try to get as much of the tumor out as possible, and then it varies the treatment, either radiation, chemotherapy, or combination of the two, and those patients have a much worse outcome and it can be associated with Lefromini, so I would keep that in mind as well. And then craniopharyngioma, for two seconds I'll get on my soapbox. This is one of the reasons I hate the term benign brain tumor, because this is a benign brain tumor that causes significant morbidity in patient, and that term benign kind of gives you a false sense of security. So, okay, I'm off the soapbox. So, um, rare epithelial tumor thought to be done due to maldevelopmental origin or poor embryogenesis represents about 6 to 9% of all pediatric brain tumors. Patients usually present with headaches, vomiting, and vision or endocrinopathies. 
vision problems. And usually if you test for all endocrinopathies, about 80 to 90 percent will have them. They may be rare ones like growth hormone, which won't show a symptom right away, but it would be there if you tested for it. The most common location is the supracellar region and the pituitary region, similar to a uh, germ cell tumor. Imaging, imaging will show a cystic mass, oftentimes with calcifications, and you can also see keratin when you look at histology. Ideally, you want to get as much of the tumor out as possible. If you can do that, you may be able to just watch the patient with surveillance imaging. If not, the other therapy is focal radiotherapy. And although progression-free and overall survival looks pretty good, again, these are patients that have multiple endocrinopathies throughout their life. They can have frontal lobe disinhibition. They can have obesity from hypothalamic dysfunction, and oftentimes have multiple morbidities. Okay. Big stretch. Okay, almost there. Late effects. So I really basically only have one or two slides on late effects. Uh, this one point I think I've said three or four times, so if they don't ask you about this, tell me, and then we'll take it off the slides. But I think they're going to give you a scenario where CNS radiation in the past leads to a, a secondary malignancy, usually a high-grade glioma or a meningioma. This classically occurs seven to ten years after you got your radiation. That's a unique time frame and often different than secondary leukemias, so it's important to keep it in mind. The risk of developing this is pretty low, usually less than 5 percent, but unfortunately if it's you, it's 100 percent and can be devastating, especially if it's a high-grade glioma because the outcome is even worse when, than compared to a newly diagnosed high-grade glioma, which I told you was very poor. Radiation therapy, unique to patients with CNS tumors. There's neurocognitive decline, ototoxicity, endocrine dysfunction, secondary malignancy, and then cerebrovascular events. So you can have strokes. Also in patients with an NF, which we talked about previously, NF1, they have increased risk of moya moya, so you don't want to give them radiation if at all possible, in addition to the risk of secondary malignancy. The chemotherapies, I'm not going to go through these because these are similar to what you probably have talked about. We don't use any super unique chemotherapies or the late effects. The one I would highlight is intrathecal methotrexate, although you see that in leukemia as well, but we sometimes use it, use it in some of our patients, and those patients can get leukoencephalopathy, which may or may not be um, symptomatic. So I'm just going to end with this one um, question, which I think would be a classic test question. A patient comes in who's 20 years old to the ER with complaints of headache and vomiting, right-sided weakness. He was treated at age 10 with craniospinal radiation and chemotherapy because he had medulloblastoma. Imaging receive, reveals a left-sided mass with associated hydrocephalus, mild midline shift, which means everything is squished to the side, which is not good. So the differential must include a secondary-induced malignancy from radiation, most likely a high-grade glioma, less likely but possibly a meningioma. Outcome is very poor if it's a high-grade glioma. And then the latency period, as I mentioned, is about seven to ten years. So that, my friends, is our whirlwind tour. Boards, schmords, you're going to do great. Um, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me by email. This is my direct email. If you have questions as you go through the questions that I wrote or any questions about the slides, or please, if you have patient questions, I'm happy to answer them as well. Thank you so much.